Tell me if you know this line. It's me. Hi. I'm the problem. It's me. Anybody heard that line? Everybody know what that is? That's from the Taylor Swift song, Antihero. Well, I bring that up because it could be a, a song, a line written by the prophet Jonah. He could call his song the anti-prophet. Because Jonah is unlike every other prophet that we have in our Bible. He's the most anti-prophetic prophet in the whole canon of prophetic texts. It's actually quite funny when you read it. Because sometimes we can forget that the Bible can be funny. We put that whole Shakespearean voice on the Bible, that, that serious voice that when we read the Bible it has to be read like this. And we lose kind of the intricacies and the funniness of, of some of the biblical texts. It's not always there, but it does show up. And the book of Jonah is actually quite funny because it's quite absurd. And the prophet Jonah is absurd. Go home and read it. You, maybe you'll find it this way. It's a short book. It's just four chapters long. In my Bible, it's a page and a half. It doesn't take a long time to read it. But let's go through this story of Jonah. First, God calls Jonah to go into Assyria, go to Nineveh, that capital city, and prophesy, say the words that God is telling Jonah to say. It's called a prophetic call when the prophets are first called into, their, into being a prophet. And it's standard, if you go through all the prophetic texts, it's standard for a prophet to argue with God. The prophet generally doesn't want that assignment, generally doesn't feel themselves to be worthy. You can read Isaiah, Jeremiah, all of them. They all argue against their ability to be a prophet. But Jonah doesn't argue. Jonah hears God's call, and like Forrest Gump, just starts sprinting away as fast as he can. Gets on the nearest ship that he can get on to go to Spain, to go to Tarshish. He, he, it's, a, it's a kind of a funny thing. You hear the voice of God, and then you just start running. I don't want anything to do with that. I don't want that to be in my life. I don't want anything to do with being a prophet. Just get out of here. Well, he gets on the boat. And this is the famous part of the story that we probably all know. He gets on the boat and God sends a storm and is threatening all of the sailors on this boat, threatening the safety of this boat. And, and, and Jonah knows what's happening. Jonah knows that it's him that's causing the storms. And he tells the sailors, just throw me over. It's a, I should just, I should, I'm the one that's causing this danger and, 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 and I'll just die. You can throw me over the board and you all will be safe. But the sailors don't want that, his blood on their hands. And so they go and they pray to their own gods and they get permission and they end up throwing Jonah out of the boat because he wants to die rather than to be a prophet. But God doesn't want that. So God sends a big fish, swallows Jonah into his belly. And it's at this point where we get one of the most beautiful prayers that Jonah prays while he's in the belly of the big fish, the belly of the whale, as we say. The beauty of the prayer is counterbalanced by the absurdity of the location of this prayer. And immediately after, he's thrown overboard, the storm quiet, so everybody ended up being okay. And so after this beautiful prayer, three days being in the belly, the Lord directs the fish to vomit Jonah onto the shore. <laughs> More absurdity. Vomit Vomits the prophet to safety on dry land. And God then calls Jonah for a second time. Tells him to go prophesy to Nineveh. And this time, Jonah hears the call and goes to Nineveh. But after taking in all the absurdity that's happened so far... If you continue reading, even jo Jonah's prophecy is funny and absurd. See, the scripture says that Nineveh is a big city, about 100, 120,000 people. And it takes three days to walk across the whole city. And scripture says that Jonah walked and his entire prophecy was five words. Five words. That's all scripture says Jonah said. 
So to put it another way, Jonah walked for three days and said five words to a third of the city. And all he said was, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, <laughs> I see a five-year-old being told by a parent to go apologize to another kid for stealing a toy. I imagine Jonah's walking through Nineveh. He's fulfilling his duty. He's walking through Nineveh, just skulking. And then, you know how kids apologize? I'm sorry. Without really looking the other kid in the eye and without really meaning, he's sorry. I, I can imagine Jonah doing this. He's skulking across Nineveh, stops and says, 40 days more, Nineveh shall be overthrown. And then keeps walking and finally leaves the city. The only problem is, <laughs> here's the absurd part. In the entire prophetic text, in the entire canon of prophecy that we have in our Bible, Jonah is the most successful prophet. Skulking across Nineveh saying five words, 120,000 people, including the animals. They say the animals bear sackcloth and go fasting. 120,000 people, including the animals, completely repent and turn their ways. Do you know how absurd that is? Go back and read Isaiah. Go back and read Jeremiah. Jeremiah did street theater naked to try to get people to hear his message. And Jonah said five words and was and, and, and over, completely changed the whole entire city. <laughs> this has never happened in the history of prophets, and it happened to Jonah. And now, was Jonah happy about being the most successful prophet in the history of the canon of prophetic texts? Come on, we all know it. No, he was not happy. In fact, he was so angry that he told God that he would rather die than see God show mercy to the Ninevites. He said, I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Let's put that in English. He said, I'd rather see them destroyed than have the words you gave me be successful and see them have mercy, love, and grace shown to them. I would rather die than to see them survive. That's pretty absurd. Then he goes out of the city, which is the part that we read in. He sets up a little sitting area, and he waits to see what's going to happen to Nineveh. He's waiting to see the comets fall from heaven and God completely wipe out the city. Or he's waiting to see that it's better for him to die. So it's absurd. And it's funny in a surprising, absurd way that Jonah is the most anti-prophetic prophet, an anti-hero of sorts. But Jonah's not completely... He's not doing this in a completely absurd way. As one writer put it, God's steadfast love is what makes Jonah angry. It's God's steadfast love that makes Jonah angry so much that he would rather die and live to see, than to see the Assyrians receive God's mercy. He's, he has perfectly valid reasons for this. When you, when you see the history of Israel, Assyria is one of the first major kingdoms to conquer Israel. And Assyria was a violent, oppressive kingdom that had conquered Israel and destroyed the whole northern kingdom. And since that time, they were known for their violence. They were known for how they subjugated, taxed, and oppressed the southern kingdom of Israel. And they did it for years before the Babylonians came in. They, were the, they were originally were the conquerors of, of Israel. And so there was a reason for Jonah's hatred, a valid reason. But as Jonah says to himself, our God is a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. It's hard to take in that those words are meant for everybody. All of us. It is us and it's also the people that we despise. It is us and it is also our enemies. 
You might remember in 2011 when the United States hunted down and killed Osama bin Laden in Pakistan. It was good news. President Obama announced it on a nationally televised uh, speech, and, and people gathered outside the White House, people gathered in New York, people gathered all throughout the United States to celebrate the killing of Obama, Osama bin Laden, the person responsible for killing thousands of people, and he was finally dead. Well, there was a man named Henry Borga living in Florida, and he was a devout Catholic. He attended Mass on a regular basis. And I guess he attended a big church because in order to put somebody on the prayer request list, you had to pay $10. And so he paid $10, and guess what? He put Obama, Osama bin Laden on the prayer request list. And you can imagine the uproar that this caused. People weren't just mad. They were church mad. And when people are church mad, that is a mad mad with a, the, uh, with a theological fervor behind it. That is an angry, angry mad. So when a, when a reporter asked Henry Borga why he put bin Laden on the prayer request list, Borga said that he was a very bad man and he deserved to be punished in life, but not losing his life. He needs forgiveness and compassion from God. His priest then added to the statement and said, some people from their emotions don't want us to pray for him. I can understand that, but we cannot do that. We are to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. Judgment is reserved to God alone. See, it's easy for us to read Jonah's prophecy and say, yeah, Jonah, what are you doing? How, how can you behave that way? It's another thing to put it in our terms and to think about how absurd we might be when we talk about God's love and God's mercy. Are we willing to pray, pray for compassion and mercy for Osama bin Laden? That's tough. And I think when we start to think about that, we might start to realize that we even need to think about Jonah in a different way. It's hard for us to fully grasp God's love and God's mercy. As one person put it, we tend to reject this mercy for our enemies, but desire it for ourselves. We hear over and over about how bad things are today. I hear it, and I'm guilty of it. I say it, too. But perhaps, perhaps there's something in us that we need to examine. How are we maybe not allowing God's grace and mercy in our lives to be truthful, not just for us, but for others? people that we might not understand, people that we might not be, uh, believe have the best interest at heart, people we might see as enemies. The question for me in thinking about Jonah is that he was more upset about being having the sun bear down on his head rather than 120,000 people being saved because of their, their repentance and their change of heart. Do we have that same absurdity in our own lives and how we think about others, how we think about ourselves? Maybe we need to think about that song that Taylor Swift sang. Hi, it's me. I'm the problem. It's me. And maybe by examining our own hearts and maybe living more like the Assyrians and repenting on the, the things that we've done that might not be, sure, we might not have killed and it caused oppression and all this other stuff, but there's things that we've done that we might not be proud of that might be going against the, the will of God and the call of God. Maybe we were like Jonah and, and just hearing God's call and running away because we don't want to have to face what God is asking us to do. Maybe we're, we're, we're just not willing to live, give the love and the grace to everybody that we know God is giving. 
Maybe we're grudgingly doing the work of God, just doing what we got to do because we know God called us to do it. So we're going to do it. We're going to do it as much as we can. And whatever happens, happens. But we're not going to like, fully live into it. Maybe that's what it is. How can we grasp the love, mercy, and grace of God and allow it to be for all and not just for ourselves? I wonder, I wonder how that might change how we see the world and how the world actually is. To me, that's the question of Jonah. Do we have that grace and that mercy that Jonah didn't have. Amen.